Well, hello, calculus students and seekers of general truth. We continue our study of series error approximations by looking at another method. We, in the previous video, talked about the alternating series error bound and how that applies. And now let's look at another approach. And this is um, something that Brooke Taylor came up with uh, and some other mathematicians as well. We'll talk about them a little bit later. But Taylor basically sort of snuck up on the error. And I'm going to show you um, how this is done. Okay, So we're going to start out with a problem that looks kind of unrelated and it just seems kind of totally random and, and, and off track. But then I will show you how it converges to the solution that we're aiming for. Pardon the pun. Um, the the unrelated problem will ultimately lead us to another error approximation method. Okay? And so let's get right to it. Uh, let's look at, and this again, this is Taylor's unrelated uh, uh, exploration. And of course, I put unrelated in quotes because it actually is related, but I will show you uh, how we can arrive at our result. Okay? And there is really no good explanation that I have for why these mathematicians started out this way. They just, this is part of their genius that they started out with some unrelated problem and they connect it to the, the problem that's at hand. Okay, so let f be a function that's approximated by this Taylor series centered at c, at x equals c. Okay. Now, f is also a function that has all derivatives on some interval between c and x. And when I say all derivatives, I mean a function that you can take the, the derivative of infinitely many times. For example, the sine function, right? Uh, you can take the first derivative, the second derivative, and you keep on going with these derivatives, and you never actually stop. You, you, you never actually stop at zero. It's just kind of cyclical. Okay? And because f is, um, has derivatives at on this interval, f also satisfies the mean value theorem. And so let's re recap what the mean value theorem says. There exists some point A that's between x and c and it's on this interval such that f prime of A, the instantaneous rate of change at A, is equal to f of x minus f of c over x minus c. In other words, the average rate of change of this function on this interval. Now, um, because f is a function with all derivatives, that means its first derivative, its second, third, and fourth derivatives, and all of its derivatives satisfies the mean value theorem. Okay, so it, again, because f is this unique function that has lots of uh, derivatives, uh, you know, e to the x, cosine x, um, sine x, and many others, right, that you could just keep on taking the derivatives forever, uh, we know that the derivative must also satisfy the mean value theorem. And for the sake of this exploration, we are going to consider f prime, f double prime, excuse me. So f double prime satisfies the mean value theorem. Therefore, there exists a point A on this interval such that the derivative of f double prime or f triple prime, the third derivative, is equal to the average rate of change of the second derivative. Okay, so we're taking the mean value theorem. Instead of applying it to f, we are applying it to f double prime. And this is the result that we get. Now, continuing on with this, uh, we are going to, again, explore doing this quote-unquote unrelated exploration and see where it leads us. So we're going to regroup and then take the antiderivative. So we're going to multiply both sides by x minus a, and we get this expression. So at this point, you should make sure that you understand what all of these letters mean. We are taking, we're doing some mathematics here without any actual numbers. So make sure you understand what all of these letters mean. Uh, and then we take the integral uh, with respect to x. So I put the integral sign and the dx around everything. All right now, when I take the 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 antiderivative on the left side, uh, x minus c here, that's sort of my variable expression. It becomes x minus c quantity squared over 2. And just, this is just antiderivative rules. On the right side, f double prime turns into f prime. f double prime of c is a constant, so we add an x to this. In other words, this is f double prime of c times x to the 0th 
So taking the anti-tide derivative, we get this. Big K here is my constant of integration. And then we're going to solve for big K by using the point um, x equals c. So at, we can plug in anything we want for x to solve for the constant of integration. We're going to use the constant c. And the reason I do that is, you know, I started out with my expression here. When I plug in c for x, this left term goes down to 0. On the right side, all of my x's turns into c. So f prime of x, f prime of c, double prime, f double prime of c, f double prime of c, um, this x here turns into a c. Okay, so I'm plugging in c for all of my x's. And now this expression here is the constant. I uh, rearrange it, take all this stuff here and push it to the left side, flip the signs, and I get positive f double prime of c, c minus f prime of c equals k. Now that's a mouthful, so um, I, rec I recommend you just pause the video here and just think about what this means and make sure that you understand how all of this works. Why we do this will become more clear when we finish this exploration. All right, well, now continuing on, I take my original expression here and I remove the constant and I substitute it with this result. Okay, so instead of f prime of x minus f double prime of cx plus k, I plug in this thing here because that's what k was equal to. Okay, so I have this new expression now. Uh, and again, there's no good reason yet why we're doing this. You should just think about how all of this works, how all of these equality statements are true. All right, so now we have that. Then what we're going to do is integrate again. Okay, so we'll take another integration. Um, integrate the left side and integrate the right side. Okay? And on the left side, I have f triple prime, or the third derivative, at some point a. That's a constant. x minus c squared becomes x minus c to the third. My 1 half here is a constant, stays the same. And when I integrate it, I get um, x minus c quantity cubed over 3. And so these are rules of integration that I'm applying here. On the right side, f prime turns into f. f double prime of c at x turns into f double prime of c x squared over 2. This c here, this f double prime of c, c, we attach an x to it. And f prime of c, that's a constant, so we attach an x to that. And then we have a second constant of integration. So again, performing integration, all the constants have x's, all the x's get a power increase and divide by the power. So straight up rules of, we're just integrating some polynomials here. Okay, so we're almost done. We have this expression. We use k equals 2, set x equal to c, and we solve. So again, the left side here becomes 0, and the right side, all of my x's turn into c's. That x, that c, this x, this c, this x, this c, and my constant of integration. But if you notice here, these two terms in the middle, they're actually like terms, right? This is f double prime c squared. And this term here, c times c, that's the same thing as c squared also. They're like terms. You have a negative 1 half times something plus a positive 1 times that same thing. And so that reduces to positive half. Right? So these two terms in the middle here reduces down to this. The other two terms stay the same. Nothing has really changed. Then I push everything to the left side. I get the value from my constant of integration. So that's what we had before. We solve, and this is what we get for our constant of integration. And then we substitute back, and we get this big thing right here. So instead of using, instead of having a plus k2, I substitute in all the stuff that I solved for, for k2, from the previous slide. Okay. And this seems crazy and messy, but the genius of Taylor and other mathematicians who worked on this problem is that they were able to see a pattern in this and some of the work that they do is uh, relatively simple. So let me show you. So that's the expression that we had, all this mess here. But if you notice, we have some like terms, or not like terms, I'm sorry. We have some terms that we can factor out. You see all these, these three terms, we have an f double prime c in each of them. And these two terms, we have a f prime c in each of them. 
So I'm factoring out a negative F double prime C out of all of the terms I circled in red. And what I end up with is X squared over two, that's here. This is CX that goes here, and then C squared over two. Okay, and I'm factoring out a negative F double prime C, so all the signs in here get flipped as well. Um, for the stuff I circled in blue, similarly, I factored out F prime C, and I end up with positive X minus C. This, this remaining term stays the same. Nothing changes. On the next line, what we do is we factor out a one-half from this square bracket here. So we pull out a one-half, and x squared over 2 becomes x squared. This becomes negative 2cx, and this becomes positive um, c squared, rather than this half here goes away. Everything else is the same. And then these three terms right here, x squared minus 2cx plus c squared, that factors neatly into x minus c quantity squared. Okay? So I get this big expression here. And it would seem that I'm done, but I'm actually going to keep on going, and uh, I'm going to complicate things just a little bit further. So this is what I had from the last slide. And now I'm going to take the uh, factor out a negative 1 out of f double prime c, f single prime c, and f of c. So I have this negative here, and inside of the square bracket, everything, the, the signs here turns into positive. Okay, so instead of minus f double, f prime c, it's positive, minus f c is positive. Instead of negative f double prime c, it's this. And again, this is an unrelated exploration, quote unquote. So we're going to keep on going and see where this takes us. And we're going to stop when, uh, when we uh, reach at something good. And we're almost there. So we complicate this further. Instead of saying 2 times 3, that's, that's the same thing as 3 factorial. Um, this 1 half here is really the same thing as dividing by 2, which is the same thing as dividing by 2 factorial. And we're there's, there's a 1 that we're dividing by, so we call that 1 factorial, and we say that we're dividing by 0 factorial. And remember, 0 factorial is 1. Okay. And if you notice here, what we have is something familiar now. All this mess, after some factoring, some algebra, we get something familiar. This f of x here is our infinite Taylor series. This right here is really the second degree Taylor polynomial. Right? This is the, the summation of the z zero derivative at C over zero factorial plus the first derivative at C times x minus C to the first over one factorial. And this is the second derivative at C times x minus C to the second power over two factorial. And this over here is sort of like the third term, or sort of like the third degree polynomial, but not quite, because we have the third derivative of some unknown point A. Right? A here is the place where the instantaneous rate of change of the second derivative matches the average rate of change of the second derivative. Okay, and this stuff on the left side, we call this is the third derivative of f at some point a. And we don't know what a is yet. Uh, we'll deal with that later. But hopefully what you can see from all of this, this long algebraic exploration is that, is that we end up with an equation that relates the infinite Taylor series, or the exact answer, quote unquote, to a partial sum of that Taylor series. And that's equal to this term here on the left, which involves the third derivative at some mystical point A. I say mystical facetiously here. Okay. So this is what we have, and it turns out that when Taylor did this, he was able to generalize it. He was able to say that instead of using two here, right, I'm using k. So this is the exact answer, f of x, minus the partial sum from n equals zero to some number k. In our example, it was two. Well, that's equal to the k plus first derivative. Let's see. Infinite Taylor series. That's the k degree polynomial. And this is the k plus first, or k plus one this derivative of f at some point a. Okay. So this whole unit on the left here, we call that the error term, or the remainder term. Okay. And rather than, and there's a caveat here, of course, is that a is some number between x and c, 
and we have to figure out what A is, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Right? This big idea here, we can stop calling it an unrelated exploration, and we should start calling it by its proper name, which is Taylor's, poly T Taylor's theorem. Some places we call it Taylor's remainder theorem. But this is a huge idea. It relates the infinite series, or the exact solution, to um, the, the relation between the exact solution, the partial sum estimate, and some expression that helps us to calculate the difference between these two. And if you notice, if we take this kth degree Taylor polynomial and add it to the other side, we end up with the exact answer. So if we can only find out what A is, we'll be able to figure out the exact answer. So a little bit more on that later. This video is, is a little bit longer than I want it to be. So we're going to stop here and uh, we'll start another video that finishes out this lesson with some, of, some more details. As always, keep thinking hard. Thank you for watching and have a wonderful day.